William Shakespeare. Part two, plays, performances, textual sources, poems, sonnets, and writing style. Plays. Most playwrights of the period typically collaborated with others at some point, as critics agree Shakespeare did, mostly early and late in his career. The first recorded works of Shakespeare are Richard III and the three parts of Henry VI, written in the early 1590s during a vogue for historical drama. Shakespeare's plays are difficult to date precisely, however, and studies of the text suggest that Titus Andronicus, the Comedy of Errors, The Taming of the Shrew, and The Two Gentlemen of Verona may also belong to Shakespeare's earliest period. His first histories, which draw heavily on the 1587 edition of Raphael Hollinshed's Chronicles of England, Scotland, and Ireland, dramatize the destructive results of weak or corrupt rule and have been interpreted as a justification for the origins of the Tudor dynasty. The early plays were influenced by the works of other Elizabethan dramatists, especially Thomas Kidd and Christopher Marlowe, by the traditions of medieval drama, and by the plays of Seneca. The Comedy of Errors was also based on classical models, but no source for the taming of the shrew has been found, though it is related to a separate play of the same name and may have derived from a folk story. Like The Two Gentlemen of Verona, in which two friends appear to approve of rape, the shrew story of the taming of a woman's independent spirit by a man sometimes troubles modern critics, directors, and audiences. Shakespeare's early classical and Italianate comedies, containing tight double plots and precise comic sequences, give way in the mid-1590s to the romantic atmosphere of his most acclaimed comedies. A Midsummer Night's Dream is a witty mixture of romance, fairy magic, and comic lowlife scenes. Shakespeare's next comedy, The Equally Romantic Merchant of Venice, contains a portrayal of the vengeful Jewish moneylender Shylock, which reflects dominant Elizabethan views, but may appear derogatory to modern audiences. The wit and wordplay of Much Ado About Nothing, the charming rural setting of As You Like It, and the lively merrymaking of Twelfth Night complete Shakespeare's sequence of great comedies. After the lyrical Richard II, written almost entirely in verse, Shakespeare introduced prose comedy into the histories of the late 1590s, Henry IV, parts I and II, and Henry V. His characters become more complex and tender as he switches deftly between comic and serious scenes, prose and poetry, and achieves the narrative variety of his mature work. This period begins and ends with two tragedies, Romeo and Juliet, the famous romantic tragedy of sexually charged adolescence, love and death, and Julius Caesar. Based on Sir Thomas North's 1579 translation of Plutarch's Parallel Lives, which introduced a new kind of drama. According to Shakespearean scholar James Shapiro, in Julius Caesar, the various strands of politics, character, inwardness, contemporary events, even Shakespeare's own reflections on the act of writing, began to infuse each other. In the early 17th century, Shakespeare wrote the so-called problem plays, Measure for Measure, Troilus and Cressida, and All's Well That Ends Well, and a number of his best-known tragedies. Many critics believe that Shakespeare's greatest tragedies represent the peak of his art. The titular hero of one of Shakespeare's greatest tragedies, Hamlet, has probably been discussed more than any other Shakespearean character, especially for his famous soliloquy which begins, to be or not. To be, that is the question. Unlike the introverted Hamlet, whose fatal flaw is hesitation, the heroes of the tragedies that followed, Othello and King Lear, are undone by hasty errors of judgment. The plots of Shakespeare's tragedies often hinge on such fatal errors or flaws, which overturn order and destroy the hero and those he loves. In Othello, the villain Iago stokes Othello's sexual jealousy to the point where he murders the innocent wife who loves him. In King Lear, the old king commits the tragic error of giving up his powers, initiating the events which lead to the torture and blinding of the Earl of Gloucester and the murder of Lear's youngest daughter Cordelia. According to the critic Frank Kermode, the play offers neither its good characters nor its audience any relief from its cruelty. In Macbeth, the shortest and most compressed of Shakespeare's tragedies, 
uncontrollable ambition incites Macbeth and his wife, Lady. Macbeth, to murder the rightful king and usurp the throne until their own guilt destroys them in turn. In this play, Shakespeare adds a supernatural element to the tragic structure. His last major tragedies, Antony and Cleopatra and Coriolanus, contain some of Shakespeare's finest poetry and were considered his most successful tragedies by the poet and critic T. S. Eliot. In his final period, Shakespeare turned to romance or tragicomedy and completed three more major plays, Cymbeline, The Winter's Tale, and The Tempest, as well as the collaboration, Pericles, Prince of Tyre. Less bleak than the tragedies, these four plays are graver in tone than the comedies of the 1590s, but they end with reconciliation and the forgiveness of potentially tragic errors. Some commentators have seen this change in mood as evidence of a more serene view of life on Shakespeare's part, but it may merely reflect the theatrical fashion of the day. Shakespeare collaborated on two further surviving plays, Henry VIII and The Two Noble Kinsmen, probably with John Fletcher. Chronology of Shakespeare's Plays Shakespeare's works include the 36 plays printed in the first folio of 1623, listed according to their folio classification as comedies, histories, and tragedies. Two plays not included in the first folio, The Two Noble Kinsmen and Pericles, Prince of Tyre, are now accepted as part of the canon, with today's scholars agreeing that Shakespeare made major contributions to the writing of both. No Shakespearean poems were included in the first folio. In the late 19th century, Edward Dowden classified four of the late comedies as romances, and though many scholars prefer to call them tragicomedies, Dowden's term is often used. In 1896, Frederick S. Boas coined the term problem plays to describe four plays, All's Well That Ends Well, Measure for Measure, Troilus and Cressida, and Hamlet. Dramas as singular in theme and temper cannot be strictly called comedies or tragedies, he wrote. We may, therefore, borrow a convenient phrase from the theater of today and class them together as Shakespeare's problem plays. The term, much debated and sometimes applied to other plays, remains in use, though Hamlet is definitively classed as a tragedy. Performances It is not clear for which company Shakespeare wrote his early plays. The title page of the 1594 edition of Titus Andronicus reveals that the play had been acted by three different troops. After the plagues of 1592 to 93, Shakespeare's plays were performed by his own company at the theater and the curtain in Shoreditch, north of the Thames. Londoners flocked there to see the first part of Henry IV, Leonard Diggs' recording, Let But Falstaff Come, Hal, Poins, The Rest, and you scarce shall have a room. When the company found themselves in dispute with their landlord, they pulled the theater down and used the timbers to construct the Globe Theater, the first playhouse built by Actors for Actors on the south bank of the Thames at Southwark. The Globe opened in autumn 1599, with Julius Caesar one of the first plays staged. Most of Shakespeare's greatest post, 1599 plays were written for the Globe, including Hamlet, Othello, and King Lear. After the Lord Chamberlain's men were renamed the King's Men in 1603, they entered a special relationship with the new King James. Although the performance records are patchy, the King's Men performed seven of Shakespeare's plays at court between November 1, 1604, and October 31, 1605, including two performances of The Merchant of Venice. After 1608, they performed at the Indoor Blackfriars Theater during the winter and the Globe during the summer. The indoor setting, combined with the Jacobean fashion for lavishly staged masks, allowed Shakespeare to introduce more elaborate stage devices. In Cymbeline, for example, Jupiter descends in thunder and lightning. Sitting upon an eagle, he throws a thunderbolt. The ghosts fall on their knees. The actors in Shakespeare's company included the famous Richard Burbage, William Kemp, Henry Condell, and John Hemmings. Burbage played the leading role in the first performances of many of Shakespeare's plays, including Richard III, Hamlet, Othello, and King Lear. 
The popular comic actor Will Kemp played the servant Peter in Romeo and Juliet and Dogberry in Much Ado About Nothing, among other characters. He was replaced around 1600 by Robert Armin, who played roles such as Touchstone in As You Like It and The Fool in King Lear. In 1613, Sir Henry Wotton recorded that Henry VIII was set forth with many extraordinary circumstances of pomp and ceremony. On June 29th, however, a cannon set fire to the thatch of the globe and burned the theater to the ground, an event which pinpoints the date of a Shakespeare play with rare precision. Textual Sources In 1623, John Hemmings and Henry Condell, two of Shakespeare's friends from the King's Men, published the first folio, a collected edition of Shakespeare's plays. It contained 36 texts, including 18 printed for the first time. The others had already appeared in quarto versions, flimsy books made from sheets of paper folded twice to make four leaves. No evidence suggests that Shakespeare approved these editions, which the first folio describes as stolen and surreptitious copies. Alfred Pollard termed some of the pre-1623 versions as bad quartos because of their adapted, paraphrased or garbled texts, which may in places have been reconstructed from memory. Where several versions of a play survive, each differs from the others. The differences may stem from copying or printing errors, from notes by actors or audience members, or from Shakespeare's own papers. In some cases, for example, Hamlet, Troilus and Cressida, and Othello, Shakespeare could have revised the texts between the quarto and folio editions. In the case of King Lear, however, while most modern editions do conflate them, the 1623 folio version is so different from the 1608 quarto that the Oxford Shakespeare prints them both, arguing that they cannot be conflated without confusion. Poems in 1593 and 1594, when the theaters were closed because of plague, Shakespeare published two narrative poems on sexual themes, Venus and Adonis and the Rape of Lucrece. He dedicated them to Henry Riothesley, Earl of Southampton. In Venus and Adonis, an innocent Adonis rejects the sexual advances of Venus, while in the Rape of Lucrece, the virtuous wife Lucrece is raped by the lustful Tarquin. Influenced by Ovid's Metamorphoses, the poems show the guilt and moral confusion that result from uncontrolled lust. Both proved popular and were often reprinted during Shakespeare's lifetime. A third narrative poem, A Lover's Complaint, in which a young woman laments her seduction by a persuasive suitor, was printed in the first edition of the sonnets in 1609. Most scholars now accept that Shakespeare wrote A Lover's Complaint. Critics consider that its fine qualities are marred by leaden effects. The Phoenix and the Turtle, printed in Robert Chester's 1601 Love's Martyr, mourns the deaths of the legendary Phoenix and his lover, the faithful Turtle Dove. In 1599, two early drafts of sonnets 138 and 144 appeared in The Passionate Pilgrim, published under Shakespeare's name, but without his permission. Sonnets Published in 1609, the sonnets were the last of Shakespeare's non-dramatic works to be printed. Scholars are not certain when each of the 154 sonnets was composed, but evidence suggests that Shakespeare wrote sonnets throughout his career for a private readership. Even before the two unauthorized sonnets appeared in The Passionate Pilgrim in 1599, Francis Mears had referred in 1598 to Shakespeare's Sigurd sonnets among his private friends. Few analysts believe that the published collection follows Shakespeare's intended sequence. He seems to have planned two contrasting series, one about uncontrollable lust for a married woman of dark complexion, the Dark Lady, and one about conflicted love for a fair young man, the fair youth. It remains unclear if these figures represent real individuals or if the authorial, I who addresses them represents Shakespeare himself, though Wordsworth believed that with the sonnets, Shakespeare unlocked his heart. The 1609 edition was dedicated to a Mr. W.H., credited as the only begetter of the poems, it is not known whether this was written by Shakespeare himself or by the publisher, Thomas Thorpe, whose initials appear at the foot of the dedication page, nor is it known who Mr. W.H. was, despite numerous theories, 
or whether Shakespeare even authorized the publication. Critics praise the sonnets as a profound meditation on the nature of love, sexual passion, procreation, death, and time. Writing style. Shakespeare's first plays were written in the conventional style of the day. He wrote them in a stylized language that does not always spring naturally from the needs of the characters or the drama. The poetry depends on extended, sometimes elaborate metaphors and conceits, and the language is often rhetorical, written for actors to declaim rather than speak. The grand speeches in Titus Andronicus, in the view of some critics, often hold up the action, for example, and the verse in The Two Gentlemen of Verona has been described as stilted. However, Shakespeare soon began to adapt the traditional styles to his own purposes. The opening soliloquy of Richard III has its roots in the self-declaration of vice in medieval drama. At the same time, Richard's vivid self-awareness looks forward to the soliloquies of Shakespeare's mature plays. No single play marks a change from the traditional to the freer style. Shakespeare combined the two throughout his career, with Romeo and Juliet perhaps the best example of the mixing of the styles. By the time of Romeo and Juliet, Richard II, and A Midsummer Night's Dream in the mid-1590s, Shakespeare had begun to write a more natural poetry. He increasingly tuned his metaphors and images to the needs of the drama itself. Shakespeare's standard poetic form was blank verse, composed in iambic pentameter. In practice, this meant that his verse was usually unrhymed and consisted of ten syllables to a line, spoken with a stress on every second syllable. The blank verse of his early plays is quite different from that of his later ones. It is often beautiful, but its sentences tend to start, pause, and finish at the end of lines, with the risk of monotony. Once Shakespeare mastered traditional blank verse, he began to interrupt and vary its flow. This technique releases the new power and flexibility of the poetry in plays such as Julius Caesar and Hamlet. Shakespeare uses it, for example, to convey the turmoil in Hamlet's mind. Sir, in my heart there was a kind of fighting. That would not let me sleep. Methought I lay. Worse than the mutines and the bilbos. Rashly. And praised be rashness for it, let us know. Our indiscretion sometimes serves us well. Hamlet, Act 5, Scene 2, 4 to 8. After Hamlet, Shakespeare varied his poetic style further, particularly in the more emotional passages of the late tragedies. The literary critic A. C. Bradley described the style as more concentrated, rapid, varied, and in construction, less regular not seldom twisted or elliptical. In the last phase of his career, Shakespeare adopted many techniques to achieve these effects. These included run-on lines, irregular pauses and stops, and extreme variations in sentence structure and length. In Macbeth, for example, the language darts from one unrelated metaphor or simile to another. Was the hope drunk slash wherein you dressed yourself? 1.7.35, 38, pity, like a naked newborn babe slash striding the blast, or heaven's cherubim, oared slash upon the sightless couriers of the air. 1.7.21, 25. The listener is challenged to complete the sense. The late romances, with their shifts in time and surprising turns of plot, inspired a last poetic style in which long and short sentences are set against one another, clauses are piled up, Subject and object are reversed, and words are omitted, creating an effect of spontaneity. Shakespeare combined poetic genius with a practical sense of the theater. Like all playwrights of the time, he dramatized stories from sources such as Plutarch and Holinshed. He reshaped each plot to create several centers of interest and to show as many sides of a narrative to the audience as possible. This strength of design ensures that a Shakespeare play can survive translation, cutting, and wide interpretation without loss to its core drama. As Shakespeare's mastery grew, he gave his characters clearer and more varied motivations and distinctive patterns of speech. He preserved aspects of his earlier style in the later plays, however. In Shakespeare's late romances, he deliberately returned to a more artificial style, which emphasized the illusion of theater. From Wikipedia, the free encyclopedia, accessed February 19, 2024.